Yes, you guys, welcome back to another News Daily video. This time, I'm discussing the three big stories that have been doing the rounds today. Today, I'm joined by a special guest in Son of Chelsea, where we're going to react to our semi-final opponents in Real Madrid in this year's UCL. I mean, even saying that sentence, you guys, UCL, semi-final Real Madrid. This is why we love the game for games like this. I am so excited for it. Bring it on you guys. And before I get carried away for the other two stories, I'm going to be discussing more reports resurfacing again, surrounding Alexander. And this time, this time, could he be finally signing for us in the summer window? Of course, you guys, we have some more news surrounding Erling Haaland. And this time it comes down to Beijing and Zan. You guys, they're, they're mad. They're crazy. It, it, it's This guy, 20, making money like this. Pfft. I think this is why I need to get my son into football when I eventually have a kid. So there you have it, you guys. They're going to be the three stories for today. I hope you all enjoy. Smash that like button. And of course, before we get into anything, today's video is brought to you by Skyben. As you guys know by now, I am part of the Hold the L series. So this week, we were ranking the greatest ever Premier League centre backs. I'm going to play you guys a very short clip. It's a company for me genuinely is a better footballer for one in terms of passing around and all that kind of stuff and he's just as physical just as just as aggressive just more of a leader naturally more of a leader genuinely uh, so that's why i put someone like uh, him and terry by the way ahead of him and in terms of four village uh, village is fantastic but i think the two others on the list there that i would say are more physical center backs terry and company i think they're yeah. genuinely better players and all i can say is it was a shame that i couldn't take part in the last episode you guys because of course i would be repping the hell out of John Terry for me easily, easily ranks over Van Dyke, company, of course, Vidic as well, who is definitely the lowest pecking order out of them four centre backs for me. And of course, the Steam company, the guy, so knowledgeable, so factual, only spitting facts. And yeah, it was a very entertaining episode. So, you guys, if you want to do me a massive favor in the card above, there will be a direct link to the full episode. You'll find that link below in the description, too. And of course, make sure you interact in the comment section, like my comment there, too. And there you have it, you guys. That was the first plug out of the way. Now, I'm joined by Son of Jealousy, where we're going to discuss our chances against Real Madrid in the semi-finals of this year's UCL. Late last night, we got some confirmation in regards to our semi-final opponents in this year's UCL. Yes, we are in the semi-finals of the Champions League. No one ever thought it, but I think one thing that's becoming abundantly clear and evident is that you can never, ever write us off. So, we booked a place against Real Madrid. Personally, I'm feeling quite confident and I thought, you know, let me do something a bit different with the New Zelly video format and let me invite on a guest to discuss the game versus Real Madrid. So, of course, you guys, I'm introducing Son of Chelsea. Make sure you guys are following him. you find all the relevant information in the description below. And, hey, man, let's ask you straight off the bat. We're going to keep this quick and sharp. Um, Real Madrid's 27th of April, literally two weeks' time. Are we progressing? Can we do it? I think we can. I think the way Tuchel has set up the team so far, I think he's very much set up to be that counter-attacking team. I think he appreciates in knockout football that you don't need to be the best team. As Chelsea proved in 2012, yeah. you just need to get those fine margins right. And that's what Tuchel's got right so far against Atletico and Porto. So you've got to have confidence on that front. I think the second leg against Liverpool, Real gave away a lot of chances. And I think Liverpool could have done a lot more on that, that game. So I have confidence Chelsea could do something in this game. I just think it's exciting to face Real Madrid personally. I just, I think it's, you know, the idea of Chelsea were to beat Real Madrid, to, we'd have the Holy Trinity in the Champions League beat, beating Barcelona, Bayern Munich and Real Madrid in knockout ties. I think that would be an amazing thing for Chelsea as a club to have. And of course, the the allure and sort of the excitement and dream of getting to another Champions League final where who knows what could happen. Exactly. And I think with uh, Real Madrid too, man, I feel like I don't fear them as much as I used to before for natural reasons. I mean, they are ronaldo this right now, but it does feel like with the momentum we have on our side and maybe with how Madrid have stepped down a level slightly too, that this could be a lot more even than people expect. But of course, you know, this game will be probably dominated a large portion of it towards uh, Eden Hazard and Courtois returning back to the club. So how do you feel about seeing an old familiar face again in Eden Hazard and Courtois? Yeah, I mean, very different emotions to both players. Uh, it's just a bit of a shame there's no fans going to be at the bridge for Eden's return ah, yeah, uh, because yeah. the emotions would have been there. Um, 
for Courtois as well, I mean, I saw some quotes he gave, I think, to ESPN or someone saying, you know, I wish fans could have been there. And I'm like, yeah, you, you're actually quite fortunate, mate, that fans are not going to be there at the bridge because I think, you know, <laughs> the reaction from the yeah, Harding lower yeah. to him or the shed, you know, if he was in goal, I think wouldn't have been the nicest. But um, of course, there's so many narratives to this game. I think in terms of facing Real and facing them for the first time in the UEFA Champions League. We haven't faced them in any competitive game since 1998, which is a pretty staggering stat when you consider how many Champions League semi-finals we've got yeah. to, you know, being in this competition, not even getting them in like group stage at times. So I think that's quite incredible. So I think to me, Real Madrid are the biggest club in the world. When I think of Real Madrid, I've always been in awe of that club. And, and I think it's so special to have, just seeing last night, the graphic of Real Madrid versus Chelsea in a Champions League semi-final just filled me, filled me with a lot of excitement. And I think for Chelsea to be at this stage once again, just I think makes this season a success, you know, just yeah. in terms of if we isolate down to the Champions League, even if we get knocked out to a very good side, I think Chelsea just being able to say they got to the last four once again, I think should be seen as a sign of progression in, in the Champions League. And now we move on to the second story today. And with this story, it comes with kind of like a part one and a part two. Now to start with things, it starts with Emerson. It's very evident, very clear that Emerson will be leaving come the end of the season. We got some more confirmation in regards to the final asking fee that we would want to sell him. And that does range between 12 to 15 million euros. Now, you know, Emerson's been a very popular guy throughout Serie A for many, many seasons, as we know, because we're constantly discussing his, his potential sale on this story for many seasons now. Clubs like Juventus, Napoli and Inter Milan, are still showing very strong interest. However, it does seem like Juventus may be leading the pack at this point in time. Emerson, he wants to return back to Italy. He wants to go back to a place where he feels more comfortable. He wants to play more football. That is the main reason behind this move. And even though Thomas Tuchel does rate him, unfortunately, when you have three players that can play wing back and can play uh, left back as well, one player's eventually gonna lose out. So that is Emerson out of the way. Let's hope he gets this move to Juventus, who have been long-term admirers of the player. And now, this links on to the part two for the same story. And hear how Alexandro is involved behind the story, you guys. So essentially, Juventus, who are desperate to sign Emerson, they are happy to exchange Alexandro as part of this deal to reduce the fees. So it seems like they could offer Sandro plus a little bit of money to sign Emerson. What does that tell you about how Sandro Stock's doing right now? You'll hear my thoughts and opinions on that later on, you guys, but it does seem like a pretty ridiculous deal. Now with Alexandro, the reports coming out from Correa Della Sport are saying that yes, he is excited to be linked with this news. He is excited and ready to work on a Thomas Tuchel because we can't forget when Tuchel was at Paris Saint-Germain, Alexandre was a player that Paris Saint-Germain were desperately looking to sign for many, many seasons as well. So, you know, could it be a case of Tuchel finally working alongside maybe a left back, left wing back that he's been wanting to work with for a long time? Could this be a case of us finally signing a man that, you know, we, we thought we were gonna sign on many occasions. I remember the season where you know, the 60 million bids, the 80 million bids were being made and then nothing came from that. Could, finally, after all these years, we be signing Alexandro this summer? Now, you know, with Sandro, I guess I can understand why Juventus are more down for this. Now, this season in particular, he has, you know, suffered numerous injuries. He has suffered things like a surgery, a hamstring, and of course, picking up COVID too. So that's the reason behind why he hasn't been playing as much. At the same time, has he dropped a level as a player? It's hard for me to say that, but I get the sense that maybe he has plateaued a little bit. You know, Sandro's game was all about, you know, driving at opponents, about making those runs in behind, for him, being very direct. And, you know, the tactics did change a little bit at Juventus. And now he is suffering those small, small injuries that, of course, there are question marks now about how he could cope in the Premier League, guys. But the reality is, due to this unique deal where we could be getting a player like him who'd be ready to compete with the squads, ready to compete with Ben in the team and, you know, pro offer us that top quality experience that we have benefited from, from signings like Thiago Silva this year, I think I would be okay with Sandro being my, even my number two, being one of my left backs for competition. 
100%. I still think he's a very good player. Just because maybe the injuries have come a bit more now, doesn't mean that he's not an exceptional passer of the ball. Great in the build-up. I think he's still good defensively too. And, you know, I feel like a deal like this works if, you know, both parties are happy with the terms met. I think if he signs, this would spell the end for Marcus Alonso. Uh, we can't go through next season having, what, three left-backs in the squad. That can't happen. That makes no sense. But a part of me feels like, you know, Sandra moving to a new league, you know, a new way of life. That could be that reinvigoration that could, you know, really just uh, spark even more form from out of the... That could spark even more form out of the players. So you guys in the comments below, now consider the nature of the story that it would be Sandro plus money for Emerson. Would you take Alexandro for next season? State your reasons why. Now, we end things you guys by discussing the latest reports surrounding Erling Haaland. Now, these reports are based on the news surrounding his wage demands. And, you know, to give you guys a brief backstory, we do know that Raola and Haaland's dad have already met with Barcelona and Real Madrid. Now, naturally that was gonna happen and don't worry, they're still planning to hold talks with more interested parties in the services for Haaland. And with Real Madrid and Barcelona, you know, they are very desperate to sign Haaland and bring him to their clubs now. Here's where things do get quite interesting because even though there are positive talks in regards to a move happening, a big stall is the wage demands are happening reports. And the story is, is that an English club made an offer, declared their interest to sign him, and they completely just ended all their interest in Holland due to the wage demands which they felt were just ridiculous and way too much. And those demands are 35 million euros net per season which is a crazy amount of money i mean that's not even regarding the the, the asian fees the fees that his dad wants i mean 35 million come on i think that's way too much and it does feel like you know based on what the reports are suggesting if Horden is going to move on it you know him his team are going to have to drop those demands down a lot more but um you know it tells you everything you need to know about just how highly valued he is just how highly sought after he is that he, he can put out wage demands like this and of course the interest doesn't die down but you know it just intensifies because clubs now are looking to find a way to you know get their finances pattern and, and make this deal happen it could be a peak situation though because of course you know if you're going to make a, a signing in Holland where automatically he would be the highest paid player for any club he signs for you know, there is uh, that football culture where there are those dynamics within squads. You know, I guess the respect levels do play a part as well. And, you know, for a new boys to come in instantly, just eclipsing everyone else when it comes to earnings. You know, it'd be interesting to know how players could feel about something like that. But um, I don't know, you guys, for me, it feels like this is how the game has been moving on to for a very, very long time. It was, there used to be a time where like 100 million deals was like laughed at, was fantasy talk. And now we're living in them where players are going for prices over this and many have. So what is going to happen in football? Only time will tell you guys. And on that note, I'm going to wrap things up and keep things moving. Thank you for watching. I'm the EFC. This is Blue Lions TV. Tomorrow, jam-packed content coming out, you guys. Big videos surrounding Man City, our game. Joined by a Steam company. Great content. Make sure you guys stay tuned for that. And I'll see you guys all tomorrow. Peace.